ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 13th edition of the Z Jaipur Literature Festival in association with Nexa at Charbagh. We are delighted to introduce session number 178, Biographer's Ball, with Simon Sharma, Miranda Carter, Remy Targoff, and Supriya Gandhi in conversation with Tom Holland. Simon Sharma is a university professor of art history and history at Columbia University. Sir Simon is the author of 19 multi-awarded books and the writer-presenter of 50 documentaries on art, history, and literature for BBC Two. Miranda Carter is the author of an acclaimed series of historical thrillers, the first of which, The Strangler Vine, is set in India in 1837. Remy Targoff's scholarly area of interest is the English Renaissance with a strong secondary interest in the Italian Renaissance. Her forthcoming book, Shakespeare's Sisters, is a group biography of four women writers in Renaissance England. Supriya Gandhi, a historian of Mughal India, teaches in the Department of Religious Studies at Yale University. Tom Holland, author of a range of prize-winning books on ancient and medieval history. His most recent book, Dominion, tells the history of Christianity. Please join me in welcoming them to stage. Well, le ladies and gentlemen, welcome to um, what is going to be a, a fascinating uh, tour of the biographer's art because we have um, four people here who have all written um, remarkable works uh, and part of the fascination of the, uh, the array of talent that we have here is that they're all great biographers but they are great biographers in, in, in significantly different ways. So I hope that um, having them all on stage will enable us to explore the full range of what a biography is and indeed can be. Um, and I would like to start with, I guess, what is the obvious question, which is, what is it that prompts you to decide to live for years, maybe upon a time, with a particular subject? And have you discovered at the end of your uh, writing the books where, that um, are you happy that you've had what's been the equivalent of a marriage to the, your biographical subjects or do you absolutely hate them? Miranda, perhaps I could uh, ask, ask you to begin with. Uh, Miranda wrote a, uh, a fantastic biography of Anthony Blunt, um, the Queen's art collector, um, who then turned out to be a Soviet spy. So... Um, not, not, not an obviously appealing figure, perhaps. No, actually, it's a very good question, that, because uh, he was a, a figure who was excoriated in Britain for many years after he was exposed as a spy in 1979. And so uh, I would literally meet people when I was writing the book who would say, How, you know, why on earth are you writing a book about that ghastly man? But it is true, I think, if you spend that, this, the kind of time that is required to write a good biography, I think this book, was my first book, took me seven years. Uh, you, there has to be some kind of resonance. There has to be something that, that touches you. Kind uh, of like a marriage. It, 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 well, or indeed Almost. like a family. I was felt, in the end, I felt he was like a kind of slightly evil uncle that I, I, ne I nevertheless felt I had to kind of give right. some sort of explanation of. But it's very true. And if you end up feeling at the end that it was a bad marriage, that's a very sad thing. I, my first... Uh, a student job was working for somebody who was writing a biography of Rodin and it took him something like 25 years and by the end of it, it in fact even eight years in when I went and was a research student for him it was clear that he had very much fallen out of love with Rodin but he devoted so much time to Rodin that there was no way he couldn't write the book so it went on being a very unhappy marriage for another 10 years and that seemed rather awful and Remy you've written um, a biography of, of someone who is I mean, not well known. She's the, 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 the first um, female poet to be published in Italian, um, friend of Michelangelo, very much a mover and shaker, but not someone who, who um, has always adorned the history books. 
And so for you, there must ha have been a sense that you are, you don't entirely know what kind of um, woman you're going to end up writing a biography of when you began the project. Yeah, that's right. And I think um, writing about a 16th century, very pious Catholic woman who wanted to become a nun, uh, who ended up becoming a Protestant and was under investigation by the Reformation, excuse me, by the Counter-Reformation, by the Inquisition, I felt that I had almost nothing in common with this person as a sort of Jewish New Yorker in a secular in a secular world. And yet my experience was actually constantly feeling drawn in to identification and then to some kind of distancing. So, so you get very intimate, uh, as you say, almost like a marriage. Or, but I, I would say it was maybe because I was writing about a woman, I felt more uh, sort of uh, ego identification and then separation from her. So sometimes she would do things, <laughs> well, she did them a very long time ago, but I would discover that she had done things that I absolutely couldn't understand. And I would have feelings of sort of, it's like when your teenage child does something. And, and yeah, I felt disappointed and sort of bewildered. How could she possibly have loved living in a nunnery when I can't stand my two days in the nunnery? So <laughs> there was, a, there was a, a constant measuring of our relationship. So perhaps less like a marriage and more like kind of embarking on an affair where yes. gradually over the course <laughs> right. of the relationship you discover more and more things about... And, and, and by the end of the affair you, you were still um, I, I, happy you know, to have devoted that time to her? I was really her. happy and I really admired her and I actually felt, as I'm sure many people feel when they finish any long project, a lot of loss. You know, of, of post postpartum, now to invoke another mothering experience, yes. of, of just sort of um, this person who had been occupying my time was, was gone, had vanished. All biographies end in tragedy, basically, because right. the person dies. So, so, so there is a, a, a slight sense of bereavement when you yeah, finish. Absolutely. Um, Sam, so you've um, written a, a kind of biography of Rembrandt. <laughs> that then spiraled out into also being a biography of Rubens. What kind of kind of are you? Uh, well, the, 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 the fact that oh, that, yes. that it's although it's called Rembrandt's eyes, yeah. it's also about Rubens. It Does is that imply that you uh, you got fed up with Rembrandt and you decided no, to no, no, after no, Rubens? No, 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 no. I, you know, not really. Um, possibly afraid of Rembrandt, which is a kind of healthy response to really taking on someone by definition much more immensely complicated and you know, endowed with a revolutionary creativity. So the, the epigraph to the book about Rembrandt is a famous quote from Paul Valéry, which says, we should apologize for speaking, for which one can also say writing about art. Because when you're writing about art or writing about an artist, you're engaging in an act of translation. Your, your documents have to be almost primarily visual. And in Rembrandt's case, where we only have seven written documents by him, although hundreds about him, you have that sort of sense of, um, Oh, you know, sense of trepidation, really, of temerity is the word. Sense of actually chutzpah about doing the whole thing. But, um, I, you know, uh, uh, Rembrandt's self-portrait in Kenwood in London, in Kenwood House, extraordinary portrait where he stands with his easel and brushes. It's about 1660. He's very much come down in a world in fortune, if not in fame, was the first painting I ever saw. My father took me to see it. I must have been about six or seven years old. So I was haunted. Then I went on to do um, a, a book about Dutch culture. And the whole kind of thrust, as it was in history, were now in the kind of late 60s, 70s, was that a hero or big books about how individuals can actually uh, put their imprint on history was very, very unfashionable. It was thought to be kind of romantic fantasy, and that um, especially the notion of um, a kind of an original genius who overthrows all the rules was supposed to be absurd, and instead one should almost kind of drown the cult of personality in data about the society. Well, guess what? If you know everything about I don't know, pumpernickel prices in 1650, um, or how many people were begging in the street. It tells you absolutely nothing about why Rembrandt is universally loved and how shockingly different he was from his contemporaries. And so but it took me years and years to get to that point where I took him on. And so is, is there an implication in that, that if you have, let's call them geniuses, in that kind of Victorian yeah. idea, very Western idea, right. that there are certain transcendent geniuses, Rembrandt, Leonardo, Shakespeare, whoever. Right. Is, is biography an inadequate genre 
to explain their achievements? Well, because the, 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 the point of I their th achievement would, is that it, it transcends the biography. Ask Miranda, but I think it would be, um, if that's all you were, if you were, you know, discovering how they got married or, you know, that or, uh, you know, uh, how they responded to patrons. But actually, if I think you also analyze how the works came to be, I mean, in technical detail, I mean, exactly how the paint was put on, what the paint was made of, you know, what it was meant to do. When it, when it describes a passive sleeve or a teardrop falling from an eye, then I think that's the only way you can do it. And in fact, just one thing, because it's common to, I think, all of our interests, it's not true that genius is a 19th century invention. What does Vasari write about Michelangelo? What does Ascanio Condivi write about Michelangelo? It's a Renaissance invention, really. And is, is there a sense, perhaps, with someone like Vermeer or Shakespeare, where we don't actually know very much about them, that the fact we don't know very much about them is a, a crucial part of their, their kind of myth. Yeah, I, I, I would say so. So for me, the problem is how much license do you give yourself to infer from their self-portraits? You always have to understand that when Rembrandt, even as a very young man, does these tiny postage stamp prints of him mugging in the mirror as you know, angry, mad, romantic, glam lover, He's like an actor. He's actually putting on a kind of mask for effect. These were the affetti, the passions. So that also is a kind of, you know, you're not getting at the truth. The, the image I, I love, do you, you, I'm sure you know, um, we all know Richard Holmes' this book called Footsteps um, about, the you know, romantic, about romantic biographer where he describes going after Robert Louis Stevenson by finding a donkey and going through the Savenne. And he comes to a bridge and, the, and he thinks, right, you know, Stevenson saw this, and the bridge is broken. And for him, that became an emblem of the ultimate impossibility of knowing your subject. And I think that's true. And, Supriya, so there is, of course, another complication that biographers mm -hmm. can face, which is that their, their subjects, you know, while they lived, have also <laughs> become figures of myth. And that is obviously the case with, with the subject of your biography. That's right, that's right. Um, and so when you, write, when, you, when you wrote your biography of Dara, are you writing in an attempt to, to strip away the myth? Are you essentially applying paint stripper to this figure who's had many, many layers painted on top of him? Well, uh, Dara Shoko this Mughal prince uh, about whom I write, uh, is a mythical figure because he's very much alive with us today. today. He's very much alive in India. Uh, so w what I wanted to do was to expose the various layers of memory uh, that, that enshroud him. Uh, not necessarily get to the authentic Dara Shoko, because of course we're just looking at different kinds of representation. We're looking at his own representation through his writings. We're looking at the ways in which chroniclers represented him uh, during his time. Uh, uh, but, but you're absolutely right that um, uh, we live in an age in India where history is really politicized and where historical figures are politicized. Uh, so Dara Shoko is shorthand for a whole range of things. In Pakistan, he might be shorthand for, uh, you know, <clears throat> for uh, uh, amongst sort of liberals, um, shorthand for a creative engagement, a sort of syncretism uh, with Indic thought. He could also be sort of shorthand for some, someone uh, who could have led to the downfall of Islam. Uh, so, so what I wanted to do was to create a more complicated and nuanced picture using these primary sources from his time. Yes, and so um, obviously Dara exists in, in, in the imagination with Aurangzeb, and Aurangzeb is the, the, the kind of polar opposite, and so as you say, in, 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 in contemporary politics, Aurang, Aurangzeb mm. kind of stands for the idea, shorthand for religious bigotry, whereas Dara is, is syncretic and open to different cultural influences. And so I, I, I guess that, that when you are writing about Dara, you have to also write about Aurangzeb, and you also have to write about the whole context of the family into which he is born. So in a That's sense, right. you're writing not just the biography of a single figure, but a group biography. 
Uh, absolutely. It is a group biography in many senses. For one, I was uncomfortable with the idea of just privileging a certain great man, you know, the, the sort of the great man approach to history, which we've had in colonial times in India. And I sort of wanted to write a biography to revisit this sometimes discredited genre. I wanted to write a biography for our own times. Uh, so one of my concerns was to really see how to do that. How does one write about a well-known royal prince while also, for instance, you know, bring in insights that subaltern studies that you know, historians of gender have, uh, have contributed. Uh, so, uh, so my concern was to write about Dara Shoko and write about others, both famous and less famous, uh, whose lives and works intersected uh, with those of his. Right. So, so, so that's, I mean, that's a fascinating point that, um, bi I mean, biography begins essentially as the biographies of, of great, great figures, famous figures. Otherwise, there's, nobody's interested in writing about them. But of course, today, that has slightly changed. Um, today, there is a huge interest in the kinds of people who did not have biographies written about them. So not only... Um, uh, people from the, fr fr from the lower classes, people from minorities, um, but most notably perhaps women. Um, and you have quite a central female character in, in your biography, don't you? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, there are quite a few female characters, but the one uh, most central uh, and about whom we have the, really the most sources is Dara Shuko's sister, Jahanara. And uh, one thing that I really learned from, uh, from adopting this biographical approach um, was uh, I discovered how closely Dara's own intellectual project and spiritual project was tied up with that of his sisters. In fact, they even wrote their first books together on the same date. And that's something we know from the manuscript record, but that's also something that we know, that we can infer from Jahanara's spiritual autobiography where she, uh, where she gives a lot of hints about this. Right, and, and you, you, you also are, in writing your biography of Vittoria Colonna, are you, in a sense, did you feel that you were writing not just um, about one woman, but trying to resituate women in the history of a period that often downplays their role? I would say in writing about Vittoria Colonna, I, it was less of what you've just described, only because she actually was the female equivalent of the exceptional male. So Burkhardt, the great Jakob Burkhardt, calls her the Renaissance woman. She was the most famous woman of the Italian Renaissance. And in her wake, lots of other women then became poets and started to write. But she actually stood out. She was surrounded by men. The biography I'm writing now, the group biography, is, is something of the opposite story, where I've chosen four women writers from the time of Shakespeare. But I really could have chosen 10. Um, in other words, I'm, I'm selecting them out as representatives of what it was like to be a woman trying to write, trying to be a mother, trying to manage properties, trying to make a living, whatever their lives are, they, they are both uh, individuals with their own particular histories, but also exemplary of different struggles that women had during the period. Right, and so, 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 so um, why, why did you want to, to write a, a group biography? Was that a, a kind of response to just having spent too much time with one figure in your previous one? <laughs> no, it was really more a response to my training as an English professor and the fact that I graduated from elite American universities in the 80s and 90s and never read a single word written by a woman before Jane Austen and you know the 19th century novel. And I realized that these women, there were lots of women who were actually writing in the period I had studied at the time of Shakespeare and Dunn and Spencer and Milton, all of whom are celebrated when you go into Westminster Abbey, and where are the women? Yeah. And I realized there were lots of them, and one of the reasons I wasn't taught them was they weren't published until the last 15 or 20 years. So we've actually found these women, but no one has put them out into kind of public conversation, so that's what I'm trying to do. Um, Miranda, you, you went from writing about one figure, Anthony Blunt, to uh, writing a group biography of um, three emperors, three uh, at the beginning of the, um, of the 20th century European ones, so Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, Tsar Nicholas II of Russia, and uh, Emperor George V of Britain and India. Yes. Um, what was it that, that, that prompted you to write a biography in which three of them? Was it the sense that you could only pr 
properly understand any two of them by putting them in the context of the other, the whole lot. I, I, yes, I, well, actually, you know, we've, we've been talking about what biography can do. I, one of the things I love about it is that it is a very baggy genre in which you can, con you know, it does contain multitudes. And what I loved about the idea of writing about the three of them, uh, I mean, actually, I'm very obvious, I realize I'm very attracted to dysfunctional men and dysfunctional families. Those are the biographies I've read, uh, written. And, um, and these three men who were all cousins and who were part of this kind, this large extended uh, royal family, one of these groups of royal families. Because they're all basically Europe. related to each other. To I mean, they're all first cousins. Yeah. Um, and I thought it was another way of talking about um, the people who had power at the beginning of the First World War and who sort of didn't at the end. It's, it's, um, and I, I loved the, the I, I, I was very ignorant about, about sort of Queen Victoria. I always thought, I always thought the late Victorians were kind of boring, and then I started reading and realized they weren't at all. And I love the idea of these intertwined lives. Um, and I, I felt that it was a way of resonating with now. Uh, uh, and, and, um, and so I felt that it was, it was an incredibly interesting, for me, way of writing about both politics and uh, family and this sort of desperate interaction between the two. And... Um, and sort of revivifying a subject I, I had thought was slightly sort of dry before. Well, yes, and, and obviously there have been multitudes of books written on the origins of the First World War, the origins of the yes. Russian Revolution. But um, when you finished the book, did you think that this kind of family drama actually, perhaps in a rather unfashionable way, shed light on, on um, what the, the catastrophe of, of 1914? Well, look, I'm not going to make... Mega, I'm not saying this to, that my book was an alternative uh, causes of the First World War, but I felt but that it, it was a it, way in. I thought the, it was the, a way the in. The idea that, 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 that um, biographies of individuals are, yeah. you know, I mean, I mean it's quite an, uh, it's quite well, an unfashionable see, I idea. I think that's nonsense, to be honest, because I think that any way that you can draw people into history is basically a good thing. And it seems to me that a life, you know, all, all we do in history, as in fiction, is is make stories out of series of, of, of events, you know, one thing after another. Every academic, every fiction writer, every biographer is in a sense sort of imposing pattern on the world and on a life. And, um, and so you're always making choices, obviously. And a life is an incredibly, I think, good way of telling a period of time. And sometimes you're telling um, specific, uh, you know, ex exceptional, stories and details but often there is a sense of of reverberation and re resonance about the period and I felt that it was a really interesting for me it was an interesting way into a subject that had first world war was often written about I'm not not that that's any uh, there's a problem with that but by men and you know there is this slight caricature of the you know the people who want to read books about narrow gauge railways coming up to the Russian frontier in 1914, which gets a tiny bit boring sometimes. And people and personalities are an incredibly vivid and wonderful way of revivifying history and an event, it seems to me. And why not, you know? Well, I mean, I mean so, so on that theme, the idea that, that biography can be a way into studying incredibly complex and contested periods of history, yeah. perhaps turn to, to, to Simon, whose book Citizens is a, a, remarkable history of the French Revolution. But Simon, would it be an exaggeration to say that, that it could almost be considered a kind of Plutarchan collection of biographies yeah. as well? No, I think, um, I think it can. Does this? Yes, it is working. No, I, th I think that's actually fair. And um, in, in some ways, actually, the book was suggested to me. I've been giving lectures on the French Revolution, even while I was developing a special interest in the Netherlands, but I've been giving lectures on the French Revolution at Cambridge as a young academic. And um, a wonderful publisher, Peter Carsten, said to me, you know, you read the bicentennial of the French Revolution um, was coming up, and might I like to do that? And, and my first reaction was, oh, it's a battle of abstractions, or it's trapped in some sense. So, Marxist inevitability, whereby the bourgeoisie, its time has come. And it sort of reminded me of one, one of my favorite lines from one of the worst history films ever made. Um, actually, Raimi, you've got to see this, really. It's called Sword of Florence. And have you, have you, do you remember? In the 1950s, you're all too young. But in Sword of Florence, 
Um, Michelangelo, of course, it is he, played by, oh, I can't remember, Edmund Purdom. Yes, an actor none of you will remember. I remember him. Okay. He leaps off his horse and he lands on his feet in the loggetta and says, men, and it was men of Florence, the Renaissance is here. <laughs> and I thought, well, that's easy. You know, it got to be a historian. So I had the same feeling that it was time for the French Revolution. And I thought, no, 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 you know, I really don't want to do it as a kind of inevitable contest by which a bloody democracy takes over from a non-political arena. So I actually said to the publisher, give me a little time to see if I'm mad enough to take this on with all the books. And what I did was actually go back and read books that had been published at the centennial in 1889. And whether or not, and they had an extraordinary sense of proximity and were in no doubt that actually what we now pretentiously call speech acts, oratory, could actually affect the lives and deaths of millions, and that also people who were entirely outside the political sphere, because there really wasn't one in, under old regime France. You know, we went from a place uh, where you were allowed four newspapers within two weeks to Paris having 400 newspapers. So you invent the politician, you invent the journalist, you invent the political artist, and so on. So there had to be, apart from extraordinary human stories, Robespierre and, um, and Camille Desmoulins having been at school with each other, ending up the former, in effect, judicially murdering the latter. Apart from these astonishing stories, there had to be, at the heart of it all, um, a sense of what happens when you are leading a private life or a professional life as a priest or a lawyer, or something like that, and suddenly you decide you have to be fully in the hot light of the public arena with all the dangers that represents. So the reason it is a kind of, you're absolutely right, a sort of Plutarchian group biography, is that it was really about this dangerous door. Do you go through it? Are you gonna put your family at risk more if you don't, or if you do? So there are a number of characters, some famous, like Talleyrand and Lafayette, who all know each other. Some absolutely not famous, like the Liegeois bar girl, Terroine de Mericourt, who briefly becomes a kind of emblem of um, the way women can embody liberty, very much with stage direction from men. Um, and so I wanted to sort of trace their personal journey in and out of public life, I guess. Well, I, I, I'm fascinated you, you alluded to the Marxist um, perspective on history because all your biographies are, are, are situated amid the flux of great events that are very meanable to a kind of uh, a, an understanding of history as the surging of great tides on which individual lives are merely winking bubbles thrown up by the crashing of waves. And I wondered, did, 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 it, did any of you, while you were writing your biographies, feel a kind of slight ideological nervousness about the fact that um, perhaps biography was an inadequate way to get to grips with the collapse of the Mughal Empire or the Dutch Golden Age or the Renaissance or the Cold War. Are you looking at me? <laughs> Supriya. Yeah. Well, um, actually, uh, Sort of, I felt quite the opposite. You know, I initially started out, of course, uh, sort of a little with a bit of trepidation uh, about the form of biography, uh, but I thought that biography gave uh, gave one a wonderful way to look at a certain a slice of time. I totally agree. Uh, w you know, without any sense of inevitability. Yeah. So you, yeah. uh, you know, it's it's really impossible to pinpoint sort of exactly what the causes were, and historians can keep debating about it. But if we um, so if we set aside this retrospective view of the mid sixty of the mid sixteen hundreds, uh, and then look at that time without a sense of the inevitability, I think it gives us new insights. Uh, and then, uh, and another thing uh, that I find found useful about the form of biography was to also situate ideas, not just as abstractions, you know, sort of the history of ideas connected to other other ideas, but ideas as connected to the socio economic political context of their times, which is which is. Uh, uh, um, again, I think quite instructive. I think I absolutely agree. I think that um, that actually that sort of life writing is fantastically useful for taking you right back 
to particularity because, you know, Marxist history has given us all sorts of fantastic things. But, you know, we do have to go back to the local and the original in order to examine um, things granularly. And I think a life allows that. And certainly when I was writing my biography of Anthony Blunt, who uh, was, uh, became interested in, in um, communism in uh, Oxford, in Cambridge University in the 1930s, it was a very particular time in British history, a uh, very particular time in European history. I felt that it was a very good way of, of writing about how a lot of of, of um, Western liberal Europeans got caught up in the whole myth of, of Soviet Russia as a sort of utopia um, without writing with too much sense of hindsight. Uh, you know, it really allowed you to engage with what it was, you know, what they didn't know and what they did know and return to that sense of not knowing because, you know, hindsight, history is often written with, with that sense of inevitability and I think one of the things biography does really well is allow you to kind of slough off a lot of that. I just wanted to add one thing. I, I agree completely. And I actually found that, uh, in my case, writing about the Renaissance, if, if you told me I had to write a book about the entire Renaissance in Italy, it would have been you know, absolutely yeah. overwhelming. But it's also the case that one picks up on things that didn't make it into the sort of history of ideas that surround the period. So one good example for me is that I had studied, certainly, the Counter-Reformation, the Catholic Church's decision to just clamp down entirely on what was happening and, and heard in the lines. But what I never knew and never heard of, despite having a PhD in the field, is that there was this tiny period in time when things could have gone in exactly the opposite direction. And the only reason I came to understand that was because my subject decided that she loved Luther and joined a group of other like-minded people who were all reading Luther and thinking, how can we make the Catholic Church more Protestant? And but one doesn't read that in, in all of our great historians' accounts of the 1540s. So was, was that something that you discovered in the course of your research? It I, came as a surprise to you. I personally discovered it. It's not that other people don't know about it, but nobody writes about it. Yeah, but I had never, as a really historian of religion, my work has all been on the Protestant Reformation, mostly in England and on the continent, I had never known that Italy came like this close to having a reformation. And the only reason I know that is because the woman I was writing about had been drawn into this. She was seduced into this and then got posthumously put on trial for it. So through the example of this one woman's completely kind of idiosyncratic path, it opened up a chapter of history that I never knew about and that, and that most people actually don't know about. Because, because that, that is a kind of, that, that's very much the, um, the, the popular sense that people have of, of biographers. I suppose best exemplified by um, A.S. Byatt's novel, Possession, which is the biographer as sleuth, uh, <laughs> discovering lost facts, lost papers, perhaps lost writings. Simon, have you ever had a kind of a possession well, it, moment? It, where epiphany, you yeah, I did, but not in uh, when I was writing a biography, but it, it was, so it occurs as... A, a single paragraph in the first book I wrote, which was about Holland and the time of the French Revolution. Um, we've all had rainy days in the archive. Actually, if you work in The Hague, you almost never have any other kind of day in the archive, actually. And there I was, sort of toiling away on this very obscure subject, even by you know standards of Dutch history. And I was looking for a particular person, and he was... Um, he was, he was a political theorist in a minor way. It, it, there was a, a sort of epidemic of writing constitutions in the 1790s because it was unclear what kind of state the old Dutch Republic had collapsed and what kind of new state, some sort of liberal representative system. And he'd written a draft constitution. But he'd, he was also an army officer, and he'd be called up to fight a doomed campaign in the north of Holland against an even more doomed army because it was a combo... I mean, can you possibly get a more intrinsically, absurdly self-destroying army than one made up half of the English and half of the Russians? So that was Doomed. the grand old Duke of York. Right? <laughs> so he doesn't, he doesn't actually survive that. And he has an inkling, the year is 1799, he's not going to survive. Um, so he sends what turns out to be a package of stuff back to his wife. But unbeknownst to him, she's died of some mysterious, probably dysenteric fever, and it goes straight into the archive and had never been unsealed. So to get to this rather dull constitutional draft, I found this kind of package with a seal unbroken, 
you then have to go to the superintendent of the reading room who does the cracking bits, and out came the draft of the Constitution, um, a season ticket to a series of chamber music concerts, mostly Haydn in The Hague, which neither of them got to hear. Both are dead. And then, then came extraordinarily um, a, a, an envelope inside an envelope, which had a letter and a little poem, a love poem, written by him to his wife with a lock of his hair tied up with a, with a ribbon. And because it had never been exposed to the air, for uh, you know, maybe 15 seconds, men in those days, you'll know any too well, Tom, would dress their hair with musky stuff. And I got actually the smell of 1799. Wow. So you were the, the, the Howard Carter of late 18th <laughs> century Dutch history. Yeah. Well, this was mate. no Tutankhamun. But it <laughs> Wonderful was one, thing. Of those, one of those seductive moments yeah. when, you know, Auden said, history breaks bread with the dead. And you felt absolutely spookily in the immediate material presence of this very minor person. You never forget it. And Supriya, one, one of the hazards, I imagine, of writing Indian history is, mm -hmm. that, is that the climate is often not very friendly to manuscripts and absolutely, to texts. Absolutely. And so they're, they're possibly more prone to, uh, to crumbling away than they are in the, the chill of The Hague. Um, yes. Have, have you, in, in, when you were writing your book, have you come across kind of any amazing discoveries like Simon did? Lots. I mean, sort of none of them really headline worthy, but certainly amazing to sort of history nerds and, uh, you know, people who, li who like Mughal history. Uh, you know, it's absolutely true that the, you know, most of the manuscripts that we have uh, of uh, <coughs> works that were written in the 17th century have come to us in 18th and 19th century forms. Uh, and, th and those... 17th century actual sort of Mughal imperial manu writings that come down to us have, have survived serendipitously. Uh, now, it does make a difference when you're working on uh, an imperial subject uh, like, that, uh, like Dara Shoko. Uh, so, uh, it's, I have seen some things in his own hand. I have seen some things uh, in his sister's hand and in the hands of others uh, fr from the time. One, uh, there are two discoveries that I'd sort of just like to mention. Uh, one of them uh, is actually, uh, so it, the manuscript doesn't date from the time, but it is a sort of subversive history written by Sufis that gives us a very different account of Shah Jahan's court. Uh, so we actually see the imperial family's relationship with this <laughs> Sufi master who was initially aloof and then he becomes comp quite co-opted. Uh, so we have, a di we have a different view not only of him but also of the imperial court from this parallel court of the Sufi. Uh, and there's some, some information on buildings like the Parimahal in, in Kashmir in Srinagar uh, that, uh, that is quite new that isn't found um, anywhere else. And, one discovery that I'd just like to sort of mention is I was recently on this trip to Jaipur, I was in the city palace. And Jahanara, Dara Shirko's sister, wrote a spiritual autobiography called the Sahibiya. There's been some doubt cast on it, but I've actually seen independent corroboration that it is in, indeed hers. And we don't have a manuscript of it. It was printed, but the actual manuscript that was in Ahmedabad um, uh, has been lost. In the city palace, I, I found three folios. They were not labeled. They're in an album with some other Mughal calligraphy. And these are... It, fantastically sort of gold illuminated beautiful calligraphy folios from her spiritual autobiography. So time, you know, one still has to see further whether these are actually from the imperial court at that time, but it was certainly very exciting. So how did that feel, <laughs> making that, I mean, that's an amazing, say within the past two or three days. That's right, absolutely. You heard it here first here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so, I mean, how, give me some sense of the thrill of excitement that goes through you when you, when you realize that. Um, well, I think you know, this, this is just one of the pleasures of being a historian and working in archives, I think. I, I think we all have to, pleasures. you know, um, sometimes actually reading, it used to be on microfilm, and um, reading digital copies is thrust on us, understandably, right? Absolutely. By archivists. I'm, I'm an archivist's worst nightmare in that way. I, see I will throw thing. every kind of tantrum to actually get see the, the manuscript stuff. himself. You yeah. too, yeah. But, Ramey, I was just um, talking to your, to your husband, Stephen Greenblatt, about um, uh, 
monks and discoverers going around monasteries and, and, and uncovering rem, rem, remote and lost manuscripts. And you actually did that yourself, didn't you? <laughs> That's right. I spent a lot of time in, in very remote uh, archives in, in Italy, but actually in some ways the most thrilling archival experience I had was inside the Vatican, so not a remote archive, but one very hard to get into. And uh, by just total wonderful accident, there was a priest working on the Galileo materials, the trial against Galileo, who pulled down what he thought was the right book. It turned out to be a cache of Vittoria Colonna's letters. And until that moment, we never knew that they'd been investigating her. And I'm probably the second or third person to look at this. So I didn't find it. But the experience of being let into the Inquisition archive of the Vatican, which is this tiny room in the back of a, of a you know, very secret palace where they're only open like on Tuesdays from 3 to 4.30 or whatever it is, so was really thrilling. So this is really Dan this is Dan Brown. <laughs> it, it was a little bit of Dan Brown. And, and you know, just, just uh, opening up files that were meant also to prosecute and persecute your, your subject yeah. um, is also an interesting thing. There was a kind of much more hostile relationship to the materials than when you're finding, you know, something that, that was treasured, I would say. Uh, Miranda, you, um, the, the, your book on Anthony Blunt is, is wonderful as a biography of Anthony Blunt, but it's also wonderful for, for the sophistication with which you present him. Because in a way, Anthony Blunt is all about um, authenticating paintings, deciding what are fake. Uh, and this is something that, that, that playwrights have, have, have had great fun with, most, most recently in the, the Netflix episode um, of The Queen, in which he <laughs> featured, The Crown, The Crown in which he features. Yeah. Um, but do you, th uh, do you think that the, um, the, the, the complexities of the kind of biographical subject that you choose influences the way that you then write his biography? So do you, f if, if you is there a responsibility in a sense to acknowledge the uh, the character of your subject in the way that th you write the, the, the genre book. that you then yeah. construct to, to write about. That's a very them. interesting question. I don't know if there's a responsibility, but I th I certainly found that it did definitely influence the way that I wrote the book. And um, I suppose it was because he he was a character because he was. Um, when he was exposed, very little was known about him. They just people just knew that he'd been a, a Soviet spy, but the gov British government refused to produce any more information about what he'd actually done. So he almost became a, a blank canvas on which uh, people could project, project sort of any kind of, of conspiracy theory, and they did. Um, and he was also somebody who personally didn't really want to be known. Uh, which seems extraordinary in this, uh, in this era where everybody puts everything on Facebook. But he was somebody who actually went through his own personal papers and sort of destroyed things as he went along. And so I felt that in writing the book, uh, um, I, had, uh, you know, it was also, I was also responding to there's a whole genre of spy uh, biographies and spy books that were coming out at that time, which were just full of total nonsense and people's fantasies sort of passed off as, as fact. So... I had a sort of job, my job, I felt, was to scrape off the sort of barnacles of the myth and then to kind of subject everything I came across to as many sort of tests of sort of truth as I possibly can. Truth, an odd word to be using at the moment as well. Um, and it did definitely dictate the way that I wrote, I wrote the book. I, I, and in, in one of the things that became, I, I spent years on it, I spent seven years on it, and I worked incredibly hard on it. It was my first book, I was sort of willing, I was a young, eager creature who was willing to go to sort of any length, really, to try and make it as good as I could. Of course, I'm a lazy old, uh, you know, journalist now. But, uh, but I, um, I think what that meant was uh, that I worked and worked at it, and, and the sort of tone of the book almost evolved without me realizing. But it's something I'm very proud of because I really felt that, I ha that, that everything in that book is incredibly measured and that I absolutely had to sort of test everything against as many um, uh, proofs and evidence as I possibly could because so much of the writing about him had been so, so full of holes and nonsense and fantasy and because he was somebody who hid himself. Yeah. I, I, what, one last question to you all, and then I'll uh, open it up to the audience. Um, I, I'm in the midst of translating Suetonius' Lives of the Caesars, oh, which is a kind of primal uh, example of the biographer's art. Um, and, uh, what's and also the gossip's art. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And so what Suetonius does is he, he will have, say, Tiberius, and he'll say this was his ancestry, uh, this is his life, this was his achievements. Now we get onto the smut. Whoa, that's filthy. Um, and I'm just about to start on the life of Caligula, which has possibly my favorite line of, of any biography ever, where Suetonius says, but enough of Caligula the man, now on to Caligula the monster. And you know you're going to get some great stuff. I wonder... When you write about your, your various subjects, are you thinking I'm dealing with a, a, a subject that I can get to, that I can portray as he, as he or she actually was? Or are you aware that they also have a kind of mythic resonance? And if, the, if, the, if so, is it important to kind of blend the two? In other words, I guess an, a, a, a biographer is trying to redeem someone from the mythology that may yeah. cloud them, but nevertheless, the mythology is an important part of how they are understood. And in fact, you know, without, the you know without, without the individual life, you wouldn't then have the mythology. How do you negotiate between those two dimensions? Well, also, without the mythology, people aren't interested. So yeah. you have to negotiate that. I but. think that lots of people said to me, and I'm sure they've said to all of you, you know, oh, this would make a great novel, or this would make a great film. In other words, the impulse is, why don't you fictionalize this? Because there would be so much more juicy material. And in fact, I found that the discipline and the pleasure was precisely having just this material. Yeah. This is what you've got. And, and one can use the sort of hypothetical tense and say one can imagine what this person felt. Or, but I tried to resist doing that as much as possible. And I think there's a kind of integrity to, um, to not opening a door that wasn't opened. In other words, lots of people want you to explain, well, why was this marriage bad? Or was she sterile? Or, you know, we don't know. And I think yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's part of, I think, the sort of mystery that surrounds biography that fiction actually doesn't have to do. I think it actually is worth sticking to it. It's, it's amazing the number of characters from ancient and medieval history who seem to have had epilepsy. It's yeah. the kind of <laughs> fail-safe explanation for anything faintly on. Simon, you are, you're very interested in this topic, aren't you? Yeah, I am. I, I would confess that I think that some subjects of biography, and I, I won't talk about Rembrandt, but in the French Revolution book and in my book on Jewish history, are so themselves self-conscious about the way they look yeah. and the way they will appear to posterity. I mean, I think Mirabeau, you know, the great orator, the estate's general, studied his look very carefully, as indeed, actually, Rembrandt did do that. So you know a lot about what he had an in incredible hairdo. He had an enormous mane of hair, which he carried in a bag uh, on, on his... Uh, so it fell over his shoulders, and he knew correctly, everybody, and he tailored the kind of fat man's walk with a massive swag of hair. So you feel, you kind of, you know, you feel, you, you could see Mirabeau getting himself together like an actor before a mirror. And I, I don't know, there were some figures like that um, who, you, if you are so immersed in their world, you can smell them from a distance. You know what it was like to have a cup of coffee with them. You know what their boiling point was. And then, you, as Romy says, you, you sort of go, whoa, hold on a minute. And you, you, know, you keep to what the documents have before you, but you carry them around involuntarily. You're, you're being fucking well held hostage by them. By their own yeah, and when I finished the French Revolution book, I had this extraordinary sense, on one hand, relief getting out of this nightmare tornado of helpless bloodshed, violence, and massacre. On the other hand, I felt they were all saying, oh, right, you're, you're off now, are you? You know, well, have a nice life then. And they, they absolutely haunted me for literally waking in the middle of the night a long time after. And so, just very, very briefly, uh, yeah. you are obviously trying to, to get behind the myth, and mm -hmm. yet the fact remains that the, uh, the mogul court is is the kind of the, the, the great scene of mythic history yes. for, for India. Yes. And I guess you, you, you didn't want to entirely abandon that sense of it. Uh, absolutely. So what I tried to do was to, without trying to get into Darashiko's inner mind, inner self, I 
I used my sources to reconstruct the context, reconstruct the Mughal court with all its grandeur, scholars, Sufis, servants, and a whole range of other characters. And in a sense, I did feel some of the freedom that a novelist might have. Uh, because though, of course, I was uh, working with primary sources and trying to represent them, I also had uh, the freedom to write about a whole range of things and subjects. Okay, well, th thank you very much. What a, a fascinating range of, of perspectives and views. Um, do we have questions? Let's op open it up. Um, uh, gentleman in the front there. So a few years ago, on this very stage, we had Philip Henscher who said that uh, what he hates is, he hates the writing process. What he hates is having written and speaking to an appreciative audience. <laughs> I wanted to know, uh, when you're writing a biography, particularly about a difficult biographical subject, do you also feel that way about the writing process? <laughs> Doesn't everybody? <laughs> uh, I think, um, I think uh, the thing about, about biography is, you know, you're trapped with your character for, for years. And... Um, I don't know about everybody else, but I, I've written fiction and non-fiction, and the problem about non-fiction for me is that you have to check every damn half clause as you go along to make sure that it's true. So you move your... It's like moving through mud. You know, you might get a 1,000 words a day done when you're writing a novel, but there's no way, certainly for me, with non-fiction... I mean, some of you guys may be more sort of spring-footed in your writing than me, but I often feel, you know, by the end of any book, I, I, I hate it. Um, but that, for me, is a sign that it's cooked. When I hate it enough, I know that it's done. And then about a sort of year and a half later, I can look back on it and hate it less. And uh, my blunt book is nearly 18 years old now, and I look back it on, on it exceedingly fondly. I mean, I, I really love it very much now, and I'm very proud of it, but at the time... So, so I moved to biography after you know, dabbling in some more conventional scholarly writings, and for me, it was just pure pleasure. It didn't feel like work. <laughs> um, I, it, it, I don't know, you know, I've written too many books. Um, there, there, is a, there is a wonderful saying in Kohelet, in the Hebrew scripture book of Ecclesiastes, um, which, which is basically advice to young, young men, um, don't be a writer. It says, of the writing of books, there is no end. <laughs> so unlike Miranda, I never know that my book is good. Um, I actually love the process of writing. I don't know about you, Tom or Amy. There, there is a kind of almost kind of chemical surge you get on a good day. Yeah. And the bad days are, you know, can just be awful. And you, uh, my remedy for that is to just forget about it and start cooking. Um, it, co cooking. cooking is absolutely right. <laughs> a writer's block answer, really. Um, but so I, I do actually love I, I, life without writing. I, I can't actually imagine it. But there is a, that, there's that totally, you know, non-important moment of euphoria when you, the book arrives and you think, whoa. And you open it, and like a jack-in-the-box, some horrible oh, blunder split or some yeah. terrible yeah. solecism <laughs> yes. leaps out. And goes, Completely ah. true. <laughs> you know, so. Okay, and, uh, and, uh, another question, please. Um, I leave it to you. Yes, gentlemen there. Thanks very much. You've talked, touched on it already a little bit. Close like that. Thank you. Uh, when Miranda, you discussed scraping the barnacles of myth, and Supriya, you discussed engaging with great man uh, biography. But in history of events, you often have a range of methodologies to engage with, so social history and economic history and so on. Yes. For biography, do you have the same range to contend with? So, for example, would you ever have a feminist biography, not one that focuses on a female subject, but that assumes people behave the way they do because of gender theory, for example? Or are you more limited when you're writing a biography? Yeah, okay, so, so, so the question is how, um, how, how influenced by, perhaps by uh, trends in academia, uh, ideological perspectives, um, can biographies be, do you yeah, want them I to think, be? I mean, I, I would say I can't think, I don't know if any of you could think of a sort of feminist biography of a male subject um, off the top of my head, although it's a, it's a really intriguing <laughs> idea. But I do think that one is always balancing 
between the sort of local and the and the you know the the personal, and then all of the possible how 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 wide a lens do you have, and when do you bring in? So in my case, I'm sure it's true for all of us. There are moments when I was writing straightforward political history, dealing with you know, wars between city-states. There are times when I was writing straightforward feminist literary history. How is it possible that these women weren't getting heard and published? And so I do think... I do think that it's a really mixed genre biography. I mean, it's a single genre, but I do think that one is always um, following the lead, accompanying one subject into religious history, political history, social history, that these things kind of come and go. I would second that, uh, and in fact, that's something that attracted me to the to the genre as well. Um, um, can I just add one thing, which is that um, I wrote, uh, to, I tended to write about male subjects as a woman, but I've also tended to write about subjects that women tend not to write about. So I wrote about spying, uh, and I wrote about uh, First World War, and I did feel actually that there, although. Um, I wouldn't sort of academicize it exactly. I would th say that I did feel that in writing some of those, about some of those subjects that I was bringing a slightly different perspective to bear, partly on what was interesting and also about way, the way to think about some of these subjects because the books that have been written about, about spying and the Cold War tended to be from a kind of very particular, I mean, it, it's rather reductive to say it was a male perspective, but. Um, not particularly interested in psychology, not particularly interested in causes, much more interested in a certain type of sensationalism, a certain type of uh, a particular, often a kind of particular, dare I say, sort of right wing um, and condemnatory take. And so I did feel I was doing something dif slightly different, partly because I, I was a woman and I came from a sort of different uh, p position. Hello, my question is that to what extent the writing of biographies become experimental writing? That's a fascinating question. Who, who, who would like to? Take Simon. Um, yeah, wonderful uh, question. I, I, experimental, I, I, um, I am conscious, um, and it's, it's not been in, um, I think particularly with the, with the book about Rembrandt, but certainly when the last volume of my um, Histories of the Jews, that I had very many different voices. The period of that last volume dates from the beginning of vernacular Jewish writing, Jewish writing which is not in Hebrew um, or um, uh, not in Aramaic, but actually is printed and in vernacular languages like Yiddish or Italian or Ladino. And the, all, the, the actual vehicle for writing demands a kind of different ear. And then, I don't know, I, I wouldn't again call it self-consciously experimental. I wanted really to kind of amplify the relationship between the writer and who the writer was addressing himself to. I'm sorry, that's so, that is itself very weirdly knotty. I'll give you the example I'm really thinking of. The most important Jew in, in Britain in the 18th and early 19th century was a professional boxer called Daniel Mendoza. And he wrote his own life, and he wrote the first science of boxing in any language in, in the world. And he wrote it in a way which could be read by people who could barely read at all. There were lots of pictures of different kinds of boxing poses. And it was sold in very cheap forms in markets and fairs. So the first thing I really had to learn, um, being um, not a boxer at all, were what these actual physical exercises were and then what it meant to put on a, a sporting event, which was the most important thing for Jewish history at that moment. Not rabbis, not intellectuals, not writers, not Moses Mendelssohn. What it meant to put on a sporting tournament between a Jew and a non-Jew. So the writing in that chapter is, is and it, it, you always have to be very aware of the danger of pastiche. You really don't want to be a kind of cod version of 18th century. But you also want to make that peculiar tough, tough guy do writing live loudly, loudly. So I tried to do that. I don't know if it works or not. 
and, and, and I think that, that 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 answer wonderfully reminds us, as I'm afraid we come to the end of this session, that biography, like fiction, like other forms of non-fiction, ultimately is about creating that kind of spark, that yeah. sense of communion with um, people who are not us. And yeah. um, all four of the people here are, have, have their, their books are wonderful examples of that. And I would strongly urge you now to head off to the bookshop, buy them, and get them signed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much to our speakers for that session. The Z Jaipur Literature Festival is proud to partner with Air Asia India, part of the Tata Group, to ra raise awareness about the climate and work towards a greener and more sustainable future. Together, we are creating a literature forest with individual trees in honor of the speakers at JLF to reduce the carbon footprint by planting trees. One tree can offset 20 kilograms of carbon in a year. This afternoon, we're honoring our speakers with certificates for this initiative. Do note that the authors will be signing their books at the book signing desk located right at the entrance of Charbagh.